it. Yeah, 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 uh huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Now, as we come into your presence, we remember every blessing that you poured out so freely from. Compassion so amazing, Lord, we've come to give you thanks for all you've done because of your love. We're Because of your love, we're forgiven. Yes, we are. Because of your love, our hearts are clean. Whoa, we lift you up. The sons of freedom forever we change. Because of your love. Well, I'm thrilled today. We're going to welcome new members. We had some people that signed up for a membership class last week. And uh, I think the first two, if you come on up, is Kathy and, um, yeah. And who could? Ingmar. (laughs) Kathy and Ingmar. And uh, Ingmar is the only Ingmar I've ever met. Ed and Carol. Come on up. Carol Merrill. (laughs) Tell them what they've won. All right. (laughs) Just a little gift package and a little note. And then we have... uh, And last but not least, we have Rebecca. Yay. Welcome them to the Four Seasons. Uh, one thing that's coming right up just in a couple weeks is we are going to host a little lunch for the guys from Teen Challenge. 
and <laughs> excuse me, that is going to be November 8th, Sunday, November 8th, right after the service. And we'll be hitting you up for little potluck items like sandwiches and salad, just a light um, lunch for them. So I'll, we'll be telling you more about that. And then another one to put on your calendar is our traditional Thanksgiving potluck, which is the Sunday before Thanksgiving, which is November 22nd. It's going to be here in a flash. Father, we thank you for the blessing of being the body of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that we're the hands and the feet and the heart and the pocketbook and that your spirit works in us and, and through us to accomplish what Jesus himself would do. And so, Father, we thank you for the great privilege of feeding into your kingdom and touching lives, Lord, through these gifts, through these offerings. And we pray, Lord, a great blessing on what comes in to these baskets today, Father, that you would direct, that you'd show us the needs of the people in this community and the people, Lord, in other parts of the world that we might be able to help in the name of Jesus. And we pray, Father, that your kingdom will come and your will will be accomplished. And as we say those words, Father, we come before you and pray that model prayer that Jesus taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Okay. Well, are you ready to hear a word from the Lord? Yes. I hope so. I'm excited about today's message because we're going to talk about faith. We've been talking uh, for a number of weeks about holiness and um, hopefully you understand that everything you do uh, when you come to the Lord is holy. Even the, the most minute things in life are, are holy times. In the life of, of a Christian, you can make your bed in a holy way. You can wash your dishes in a holy way. You can work at your job in a way that's holy. All done unto the Lord. Um, I want to talk about faith today that, that goes through the roof, through the roof, faith. You know what I mean? You ever pray, uh, you probably had times like, like I have where you pray and your prayers just seem so lifeless. And you probably heard the expression, I feel like my prayers didn't even get through the ceiling, you know, didn't even touch the ceiling. And that's okay. It's not about you. It's about God. But it is about us in exercising our faith. In Hebrews 11:8, we read this. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, every one of you sitting here today has faith or you wouldn't be here. And um, I believe you also understand what that means, that, that God is a rewarder. That's why you're, you're here. He's a rewarder when we seek him. And when we come after the Lord, it's not, it's not for his benefit, it's for our benefit. When we, read our, when we read scripture, when we pray, when we attend church services, it's, it's for us. You know? God doesn't need any more. But it pleases him to see his children coming together. And you know what I love about the Lord, and I think this comes with uh, maturity. God said to Abraham, and we just read that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, but God said to Abraham, I am your very great reward. And that is depth in the heart of a Christian. When you realize that you don't come to God for all the stuff, and believe me, if, you have, if your heart is right with the Lord, you will get all the stuff that you need and you will be blessed by everything that he gives you. But he himself is the great reward in all of our lives. That relationship with Jesus Christ is everything 
in your life. And we're going to look at an episode. We could look at various places in Scripture, a bit of, uh, an unusual situation in the Gospels and in the ministry of, of Jesus, of some men whose faith literally went through the roof. And I call that, when we talk about roofs, shingle-minded faith. Shingle-minded, which rhymes with single-minded. And single-minded means this, having one driving purpose or resolve. And some synonyms would be determined, dedicated. And the men we're going to look at today are definitely determined. They have shingle-minded faith. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you today, Lord, we recognize, as Jesus said, that apart from him, we can do nothing. So I pray, Father, that you will set these words ablaze and set our hearts on fire and help us, Lord, to really grasp what you're showing us today and help us to live this out in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. If you want to follow along, it will come up on the screen, but if you have your Bibles, we're in Mark's Gospel. We're in chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 1. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And it begins, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. Now, I want to stop there for a minute. Because most of us don't think of Jesus of Capernaum. We hear Jesus of Nazareth, right? And we all know, I don't know if we can bring a map of uh, Israel up there, Ron, if you're able to find, if you were able to find one. I, I, ah, lo and behold. Let me push this out of the way so you can all see that. Okay. So we all know that Jesus was born... Where? So, Jesus is born here in Bethlehem, which is about five and a half miles from Jerusalem, where the, where the temple is. But he didn't stay. He was in Bethlehem a while. And, uh, you know, we know he was born in a, in a, a cave or a, a barn, a stable. See, Mary could never say to Jesus, where were you raised, in a barn? You know. <laughs> Any of you ever get that? We were raised, I, you know, I grew up with barns and stuff like that. And every, if you leave the door open or anything in the wintertime, close the door wherever you're raised in the barn. Well, anyway, Mary couldn't say that because Jesus would say, yeah, I was, you know. <laughs> and then while they were in Bethlehem, they actually settled there for a while. Because if you remember when the, when the Magi came, when the, when the uh, wise men came. It wasn't right on Christmas night. It was sometime later because Jesus is referred to as a child and Mary and Joseph were living in a house. But then God directed them away. They were in Egypt for a while. And then they went from Egypt to Nazareth. And Nazareth, can you see it way up there? Uh, uh. I need Tim Barron's to come over here because he's, I'm 6'2", but Tim, Tim is so big. Uh, Tim Barron's, I've known him 30 years. I still haven't seen all of him. You can't take him all in in one day, people. He's a big guy. So anyway, so there's Nazareth where he was raised. And Nazareth was, was a nothing place. Nothing place. That's why it was said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because it was just an ordinary. Why wasn't Jesus down in, raised in Jerusalem where the temple was? He was a son of God. He said, he referred to the temple as my father's house. But he was raised in this nothing place. And it's kind of reflective of just the way Christ's life was. It was so ordinary. He didn't have a halo, golden halo on him. He, he just looked like any other Jewish boy. Pe people thought he was the, 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 the son of Mary and Joseph. You know, they didn't get it until, until he began his ministry. Now, he begins his ministry, and we're told that he goes to his home in Capernaum, way up there by the top of that lake, or the sea of Galilee. And so then, so that's a, a, a question, you know, why is Jesus, why is that referred to his home? Because that's where he made his home base. And so we say, well, why wouldn't he have uh, had his home in Jerusalem? Wouldn't that have made more sense with the temple, with the center of religious life? Capernaum was a military outpost for the Romans. So we had the Gentile world there. 
It was also a major trading center and there were major highways that went and um, merchants came from as far south as Egypt and as far north as Mesopotamia. And so the whole human race was intersecting in Capernaum. Now, God spoke to Abraham years earlier. Who's Abraham? He's the father of our faith. Abraham, when he met the Lord, wasn't even Jewish. That's funny, you don't look Jewish. He was, didn't look Jewish because he wasn't Jewish at that point. He was just, you know, one of us, you know. <laughs> but it was his relationship with the Lord that made him a Jew. And he and his wife were childless, and God spoke this to Abraham, and we call this the Abrahamic covenant, and it's in Genesis 12, 2 and 3, and God said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation, this is before they were preggers, and they were old, and there was no chance, we, we, as far as we knew, that they could get pregnant, but he said, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and I want to say that that same promise comes to you and me when we are grafted into the line of Abraham through the blood of Jesus. That, that the Lord will prosper you. He will make your name great. You know, Christian people, people that really live for the Lord, that kind of a reputation just cannot be unequaled. Nothing like a good reputation. So he'll make your name great and, and you will be a blessing. And I see that in this church. I see people that the Lord is using, and you are a great blessing. I had to call Paul last night before I went to bed just to tell Paul what a blessing Paul, our pianist, is. He, just, he was here to play for the service yesterday. I didn't tell him. I somehow forgot to tell him he'd be playing for a service. And he came wearing his Hawaiian shirt, and I said not to worry because there'll be other people dressed like that. And there were. But then God says this to Abraham in verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. Now, people, that should make all of us shake a bit in our shoes. And that is why we support President Donald Trump. And I'm not ashamed to say that. And I'm sorry if that turns anybody off, but here's the bottom line, people. Our last president spit in the face of Israel. Our last president treated Netanyahu uh, abominably. And we see a change with Donald Trump. And trust me, that our nation will be blessed as long as we bless the people of God. And the moment we go the other direction, people, we're in big, big, deep doo-doo. So I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed because of you. Now, this people is a messianic prophecy. You can go way back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And when God, when they had sinned, when they had fallen, God took the skins of animals and he covered them. He shed blood to cover Adam and Eve. And he spoke to the serpent and he said to that serpent, the seed of the woman, he said, you will, you will bruise his head, but he will, he will bruise his feet, but, but you will crush, he will crush your head. I'm getting that messed up. <laughs> he will... <laughs> He will bruise your, he, yeah, you will bruise his foot and he will crush your head. That was a messianic prophecy. And when we read this, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. How is that possible? Because Abraham is going to have a child that would begin the lineage of Messiah, of Jesus. So, Jesus the Messiah has now come and he's living. His home now is in Capernaum where all the peoples of the earth Jew and Gentile are passing through. That's why he's based in Capernaum. John 3.16, we read this yesterday. I spoke to a lot of people that I think were unchurched people. Uh, you can always tell by the looks on people's faces and uh, by the reaction afterward uh, whether people really are getting it. And then we just have to leave the rest of what was, was said, uh, giving the gospel to uh, a lot of unchurched people, to what the Lord will do. But we know this verse backwards and forwards, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God so loved, that's where Jesus is right in the heart of where people are. He so loves the world 
And the world, again, I always like to say, it's not that ball floating in space. It's not what he's referring to. He's talking about the world system. People like you and me who had no use for God. We're going our own lives. You know, all have sinned. You know, our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so we're told that, that Jesus loved these rebellious people to give his life. So he's back in Capernaum. It's called his home base. And he's in somebody's house. And basically, he's holding a Bible study. And we pick up, we're all the way to verse 2 already, people. <laughs> Hungry yet? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I think you are. <laughs> No, I'm actually, I'm just fine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Verse 2 says, so there he is in Capernaum. He's in a, a, a house. So many people, uh, so many gathered there that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Now, people sometimes, there are things that just crowd Jesus out. The crowd people away from Jesus. And this house is crowded. You know, in Australia, they call that chock-a-block. It's chock-a-block, meaning just like jammed, you know? So it's chock-a-block, and there are people outside the door. It's kind of like, oh boy, a Trump rally. I didn't want to say that. I just, you know. <laughs> It's not like those parking lot places where Joe Biden goes, you know, where <laughs> eh, eh, people beep, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, you know, don't you feel good like you go to a restaurant? Now, I'll tell you one place. If you go to, and there'll be a lot of references in my messages to places to eat. I'm sorry for those who are fasting, and I'm one of them, but uh, uh, Texas Roadhouse Grill. That is a place over there on, where is that again? You know exactly. Yeah, Cheyenne, yeah. Anyway, uh, wherever they have those, they're always really crowded because their, their food's really good and their prices are good. And there's always people waiting. And so like when you go, you ever go to a restaurant and you, you're just dying to get in there, but you have to wait, you know, because it's crowded. People in there, especially now with the, with the, you know, spacing out of people. And so I think the last time we went with the Pops over there, we, we sat and we sat and we waited. Now they had already put our name in like uh, by, by telephone. So I think we waited a good half hour, you know, in the heat. And then finally, oh, you, you know, that little thing goes off on your phone or you hear your name called and like, ah, oh, we're going in, we're going in. You know what I mean? So you get seated. And don't you feel special when you get seated, you know, when you finally get your seat in a restaurant. You know, it just gives you, and you know what? Once I get seated, I don't know about any of the rest of you, but I don't give a hoot about anybody that's out there waiting. <laughs> just my sinful human nature. You know, I waited, now I got my table, now I'm eating, now I'm happy. And that's the way it is with these people in the house. You can imagine, they're there. They're with Jesus in the house and there are people crowded out. And we must be very, very careful people in our lives that we don't do anything that keeps people from Jesus. And it's so easy to do. And I have to take my hat off to uh, this church because I, I noticed, you know, those of you who came in here for the first time, it is difficult to come into a place you've never been before, especially a small church where you can't get lost, where everybody can see you, <laughs> you know, and you just can't melt into the woodwork. And, um, but, but that's, that's difficult to come into a smaller place. And I, I've noticed that uh, our people, and hopefully you've done this today to anybody you didn't recognize right off, that I see people introducing themselves and, and making, trying to make uh, a first-time visitor feel welcome. And that's, that's really good. But we also have to watch our schedules. And I'm guilty from time to time of, I'll recognize afterward that I should have spoken to somebody about Jesus and I didn't, you know. Or I purposely avoided somebody because I'm busy. I tell a story some of you heard it before, but my cousin, Patty, I grew up with her. And about, I don't know, 20 years ago or so, we, we, uh, she moved out here, and then we really didn't see each other for about 10 years. Our lives just went in different directions, even though we lived in the same town. And then we had a little, uh, uh, I ran into her at uh, Albertsons. 
And so our lives, we started picking up, seeing each other again. And one evening I picked her up. We live on the east side of town. We drove out to the, this side of town, the west side, to play some games with our family. And um, on th that particular occasion, she was mentioned, she said, have you, have you ever watched these? They're, they had commercials at the time that were advertising CDs of Christian music, you know, Christian worship songs. And she said, have you ever see these commercials on television with these Christian worship songs? And I, and I had. And she said, I, they make me cry. And I thought, wow, Patty. Patty, who never had an interest in anything spiritual, God is working. When people start to cry, when people get tears, the Holy Spirit is at work. So I remember I made this net mental note, and about a week later, I picked her up again, drove from the east side of town out to the west side, spent the evening playing games, and I'm driving her home now, and I am dead tired. I just want to get home, and we pull up to her apartment. I just want her to get out of the car so I can get home and relax, you know, and go to sleep. But she mentioned those commercials again, and she mentioned how they make her cry, and I thought, I can't drive away. I'm tired. But I have to talk to her. The Holy Spirit is working on her, and this is the time. And so we sat in the front seat of my car, and I explained the gospel to Patty, and little tears came down her, her face. And uh, I said, you want to ask Jesus into your heart? And, and she did. And so she walked with the Lord, not perfectly, but she walked with the Lord. And I was by her deathbed a couple of years ago. And I am so grateful that I introduced you to Jesus because I knew where she was headed. And I just said to her, Patty, get ready. Just get ready because Jesus is going to come. And you're going to take his hand. You're going to see him face to face. So we never want to let do anything that keeps somebody from seeing Jesus. But all these people are crowded in this house. And imagine Jesus is right in your area. And he's within walking distance. And he's in a familiar home. And he's speaking to people. And you don't get a chance to, to hear him. Now, I've heard some great speakers in the 47 years I've known the Lord. We just saw an incredible teaching Wednesday night, if you were here. Joyce Meyer. It was an older message about the, about the influence that we have in people's lives for good and for bad. And I'll tell you, you, you know, you can be a Christian for years and years and years and hear a message that just stirs the very foundation of your soul. And uh, years back, Billy Graham came to town, and he did a special service you know, Billy Graham was used to preaching to thousands. And when he came here in the late 70s and early 1980, I think he came, our town was much smaller. And there, were, there, there, were, there weren't hundreds of thousands. There were just thousands there. And then he and his team did a special service at 2 in the morning, people, for people in, with weird schedules like we had because we were doing shows at night. And so two in the morning, there was Billy Graham and George Beverly Shea and Cliff Barrows, his whole team, and they are there. And there's only about 200 people, and I am spitting distance from Billy Graham. And, uh, wow, Billy Graham, you know. But I'll tell you, imagine hearing Jesus himself. I mean, Billy, Billy would pale in comparison to Jesus. Now we read, we're all the way up to verse 3, people. <laughs> Don't you worry, we'll be finished by three or four. <laughs> or five. Um, <laughs> some men come, came bringing him a paralytic carried by four of them. Okay, now, he's in Capernaum. He's having a Bible study in a house. And here comes men carrying a paralytic. Now, since there, or this says that he's being carried by four men, there may have been more than four men. There, he may have had six or seven friends with him, but four of them are carrying this paralytic. This man is on a stretcher. His mind says, leg, move. But he can't move. Can you imagine? I can't imagine. I think of Johnny Erickson Tata, who, who has been a, a quadriplegic, can't move her arms or legs feet uh, and, and has been that way since the time she's 17 years old and she's about 70 now and has lived in that he's not feeling pain this man but he can't move he's paralyzed mm. and there are people who are emotionally and spiritually paralyzed they, they know what they need to do they know what they should do but they're not doing it there's a sign that was on a church marquee 
Don't wait for six strong men to carry you into church. Well, you're all here, so you're not waiting. You're not paralyzed in that uh, degree. But it's, it's a terrible thing to be emotionally paralyzed, to not move past a certain point in your life. And we probably all can identify with certain things in, in our life. You know, I've gone to Weight Watchers because I've gotten older. Oh, the weight just comes on. I still want to eat like I did when I was 17. And it's just not working. You know? And the terrible thing is when you go to Weight Watchers, you, I mean, it's a good thing. You, you lose weight. You, know, you get support. And you, you, have a, uh, you, you just have a motivation. But then you know what happens when you stop going to the Weight Watcher meetings, they put a curse on you and you gain the weight back. <laughs> and so I've been, I'm paralyzed sometimes in that area. I think I get up in the morning and think, okay, I really want to eat right today. And I eat right for breakfast and I eat right for lunch. And then right after dinner, people, it just all falls apart. <laughs> so that's not good. It's not good. And Jesus says to those of us who are paralyzed, arise. You know, arise. Arise. Get up. Pick up your mat, you know. Yeah, we're fitted for heaven when we uh, ask Jesus into our heart, but, but he promises abundant life here and now. And an abundant life is not being in a place where you have been 20 years back, you know. We should be able to look at the progress of our lives and say, yeah, you know, the old expression, I'm not where I ought to be, but thank God I ain't where I used to be. So paralyzed, paralyzed. Now think of the compassion of these men, four of them and maybe more, who brought their friend to be touched by Jesus. And you know, there's a big difference, people, between sympathy and empathy. Sympathy is feeling compassion and sorrow or pity for the hardships of another person. We all know what that's like to, to look at a situation and, and feel sadness. But empathy is when you put yourself in the place of that person and then you make every effort on earth to help them get out of that situation. And that's what's going on with these men. They, they carry their friend to Jesus. Some of you know what it is to have a drug problem. You had to be drugged to Jesus. <laughs> you'll think about that later and you won't just chuckle, you'll guffaw. Uh, <laughs> but these men carry this friend to Jesus. He ain't heavy. He's my brother. And then we pick up in verse 4 and it re we read this. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. And after digging through it, people, digging through the roof, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. Now, this is where we begin to see faith that, that goes to the roof. And we can look at other examples in Scripture. I think of the woman that had the issue of blood. You know, that was a bad thing in those days because she was unclean. It was a female problem. And she spent all her money on doctors and had not getting, gotten any better. She, in fact, she got worse, the scripture says. And there was a crowd around Jesus then. And there were important people around Jesus. But she made up her mind. She had shingle-minded faith. She had faith that was, went through the roof. If I can just touch him. And I won't let anything stand in the way. And it's the same thing these men are doing with their friend. Yes, there's a crowd there. But we are not going to let that obstacle keep us from getting a blessing. And you know, the sad thing is so many Christians give up when they, get, when they see the first obstacle. <clears throat> I have services sometimes right after the service and people come up and they want to talk to me. And sometimes it's, they just want to tell me something's going on in their life. Sometimes they want me to pray for them. And then I'll see somebody out of the corner of my eye that's standing there. And I'm really, I'm aware, okay, I want to talk to them too, but I'm busy with somebody, right? And then all of a sudden, 
I don't see them anymore. It's like they, they didn't want to wait a minute and a half, you know, or, or a couple of minutes. And it's worth the wait, people. If you want someone to pray for you, or you want to share something on your heart, or even you want to tell somebody, hey, that meant something to me. Because you know what? We all need encouragement. And I don't need extra kudos, you know. That's not why I'm up here. But, you know, it just helps people to know. It gives you motivation to know that uh, that, that word spoken reached someplace. You know what I mean? So, don't disappear. Don't leave after the first obstacle. Look at what these men do. They went up the ladder to the roof where they could see heaven much better. <laughs> up the ladder to the roof. Nobody else remembers that song oh, by the yeah, Supremes. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't that after Diana Ross left yeah. the group? Yeah, okay. That's a good song. Up the ladder to the roof where you can see heaven much better. Jacob, Jacob saw a ladder going from earth to heaven, heaven to earth, and angels ascending and descending. And it was, it was a foreshadow of Jesus. And boy, you can see heaven when you come to Jesus, right? He's the ladder. And that makes us latter day saints. Okay. Not latter day, ladder. L A D D E R, spelled differently. So they cut through the roof, people. Now, here's the problem, people, when we have our time with the Bible. And I hope when you hear me say, when we have our time with the Bible, that you're relating because you do have time with the Bible. And some of you, you just come here and you get a little Bible here or some Bible here, some good Bible here, and then you go home and you don't feed yourself. Well, that's tsk, tsk, you know. <laughs> but we read through Scripture like this. We're just looking at a few verses about this incident. And you come to this verse, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. And after digging through it, lowered it to the mat and the paralyzed man was lying on when Jesus saw their faith. You don't really think about what's going on in this scene. They're on a roof. Now, Stephanie and I have uh, like a little attic above our garage. And there's a pull down ladder. And we have, a, there was a plywood or some sort of board put up there to store things, Christmas decorations, et cetera, et cetera. And we had some extra boards after uh, we got married to, to store more things. And I went up there one day, I was home all by myself, and I'm bringing up uh, decorations from one season because we decorate our house like we do the church. We change the seasons in our, in our house. So I went up there and somehow, as I'm carrying this box of stuff, my, f my left foot went off where the board was. I didn't realize it, but it w I just all of a sudden, whew, I went through the, almost all the way through the ceiling. This leg was like this up on the board. It was holding me, but my entire left leg went through the ceiling of the garage. And this is old uh, insulation. This just like, you know, uh, uh, like, like the open, like the, uh, like, yeah, like, like, no, not fiberglass. It's like um, stuffing in a pillow, you know. So, boom, and of course I'm in shock, and I'm up in this position like this, and I'm trying to see if everything's been okay, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> I somehow, I was, you know, I was just so shocked, so I pulled myself, you know, up, and I thank God, I, I didn't break a leg or an ankle or a foot or anything. I, so I went back downstairs and the mess in that garage, the, you know, the fiberboard from the ceiling, this stuff, and then, then all this, uh, just uh, insulation everywhere, just from my foot going through. Now picture this, these men are sawing a spot in the roof of this house big enough to lower a man through it. And roofs at this time, they had beams that went across and then the, the, uh, the roof was made of a mud plaster, you know, with straw and hardened mud and twigs. And, and they begin to saw or push through this roof. And now you got to picture the Bible study going on below. You know, people are sitting there. Jesus is talking. Nobody knows what's going on. All of a sudden, little dust particles are a little piece of straw. Somebody notices, notices on their, in their coffee cup, you know, oh, I got some straw in there. Their donut's just been messed up. And all of a sudden, Boom, a piece of uh, mud plaster, boom, falls on somebody. And now the people are scattered. You know, they're moving out of the way, you know. And there's all kinds of chaos and mess coming down. 
And I can just picture Jesus just sitting there kind of smiling because I think that Jesus was seeing a demonstration of these. I think he knew something's going on here that's connected with faith. And Jesus sees this man on the mat. All of a sudden, he's lowered down like from outer space. The sunlight starts to come through. All of a sudden, bright light comes into this darkened house. And this man comes down on a mat in front of Jesus. And there's mess everywhere. And Jesus is not the least bit disturbed by the mess. And what that says to us people is that Jesus is not the least bit surprised or the least bit disturbed of all your messiness. And looking at you, I see mess. Not really. <laughs> no, you all look pretty good. <laughs> but that's the easy, easy to look unmessy in church, isn't it? And I want to say this. Jesus isn't afraid of people's messes, and neither should the church be. Neither should the church be. Now, we should be concerned that there's sin going on in the church, and it's infecting people. But mess, someone who wants out of a mess, we shouldn't be afraid. So we look now at verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, here comes the man. These men have lowered this man down. I don't know how Jesus knew the other ones were up there. They must have all been looking down, all these faces, looking down at their friend. And Jesus looking up. <laughs> and he says, when he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. This shingle-minded faith, this faith that goes to the roof, proves itself when Jesus saw their faith. Do people see your faith? Hmm. James said in chapter 2, verse 18, Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show, my, show you my faith by what I do. And he says in verse 20, Faith without deeds is useless. Works don't save anybody. Faith saves you. And, and works don't get you special brownie points with God. You know, he, already, he loves you just the way you are. But basically, our faith, if we really have faith, it's going to, it's going to show in what we do. Mm. I have to brag again on Paul. Last week, uh, Gino, I thought he would be here. Gino? No, Gino's not here. Well, anyway, Gino has been in the hospital. So a week and a half ago... Gina was in the hospital, older man, for surgery, 77 years old. His wife is back in Philadelphia. She, she, anyway, she got stuck back there with COVID, and then she broke her shoulder after she got over the COVID. And so they're separated, so he doesn't have anybody here with him. 12 o'clock at night on a Wednesday night, Paul and I are going to pray, are going to uh, lead worship for a pastor's group the next morning at 11. 12 o'clock at night, Paul's phone rings, and Gino's saying, Come and get me out of the hospital. The hospital he was in didn't have a piece of equipment. They wanted to transfer him to another hospital where they didn't, didn't have the equipment. And I can't imagine a hospital in town not being able to transfer a 77-year-old man at 12 at night. So he calls Paul, and Paul picks him up at midnight, goes and picks him up and takes him to this other hospital. And, you know, that's faith in action. Thank you, Paul, for doing that. That's so sweet. And people are, uh, some of the women here in the church, uh, Cheryl and um, Zena, and some others have been trying to bring meals over to um, uh, Gino. And yesterday, those of you, Vicki, I got to point you out because uh, we're having a service, a funeral service for uh, Jill Novak and her, you know, her husband passed away. And a lot of people don't even know Jill really well here, but a, a number of you ladies showed up and you just were out working in the kitchen. And, and, and those of you who came and attended and just being here to support that's a, that's a beautiful thing, and it's your faith working in action, and I got to uh, brag on Bill back there. Man, this, this guy, okay, our toilet backed up a couple weeks ago. <laughs> you know, there's, there's not, not a worse feeling in the world than when you flush that toilet, and instead of going that direction, it comes back at you. <laughs> it's alive! <laughs> and so we called... Bill's friend who's a plumber and uh, Robert couldn't get there for a couple days 
well, we have other toilets in the house. We could have survived. But Bill comes over that Friday, and he brings a snake over. I don't mean those of you who may have been from a snake handling background, one of those kind of snakes, one of these, you know, uh, a line, you know. So he, now Bill lives like 10 or 11 miles from where we live on the east side of town. So he comes over, puts the snake down the thing. Well, the snake isn't big enough to get the clog. So Bill runs back from our side of town to this side of town, 10 miles. He's just driven about 11 miles. Now he drives back 11 miles, and he goes to Home Depot or Lowe's, and he rents a snake. And then he drives back 11 miles. And he comes back, and he goes to use that snake, and it doesn't work. It's broken. Well, at this point, it's my day off, and I'm just like, ah, oh, let's forget about it. You know, let's just, just leave, it, leave everything flush, and we'll deal with it later. But not Bill. Bill gets back in his truck, and he goes back to this side of town, another 11 miles, and he goes back to that Lowe's, and he gets another machine. And now it's dark, and he brings it back 11 miles, and he runs that uh, snake into the thing, and he unclogs our <laughs> plumbing, you know. But, you know. Who's going to do that? I'm not anointed for that, people. I'm glad he is, because I am just not a snake handler, you know. <laughs> Faith without deeds, it's useless. Do you, do you bow your head when you go to a restaurant? Do you pray before your meals? I love when I see people at a table and their heads are all bowed and they're praying. And it tells me, people of faith. I believe at the age of 23, I, was, I knew God called me to be a pastor. I didn't understand God's timing. I was ready to leave the act I was doing with my sister and brother. And uh, anyway, that was a, a, not a pleasant year because I just kept thinking. And then I didn't really, God's timing. You know, God gave Joseph a dream when he was about 17 years old. And then it, he, was, he was about 30 before that dream began to materialize. And it was, it was 20 years later before he saw his brothers bowing down to him. You know, God's timing. You know, why do you speak way back here and then let somebody show them this vision? But when the time come, came for me to begin a church, and I just knew this is it. I could just feel it. So I went to a number of pastor friends, and some had expressed interest. They said, you know, I'd like to use you in my church if... Uh, so now it was a couple years later, and I went to these men. It was like knocking on the doors, and uh, is there a place for you and for me in your ministry? No, that door shut, that door shut, that door shut. You know, so it's like going up to the roof. You know, you got it. You got to. Well, the crowd's there. This, this door shut. This door shut. This avenue isn't open. But you know what? I know. I know what I know, and I know I'm called. So that that's why I began this church, and I realized that it just, I just would not have fit into somebody else's ministry. You know, God had something unique here. And, but it took, that's, that's faith in action. Just going in spite of any obstacles. Faith in action. We had a pastor, Pastor Justice, I don't know how many of you remember, from Bangoma, uh, Kenya. And he's come a couple of years. He couldn't come this year because of uh, the pandemic. But I'll never forget this story. that He, he has an orphanage in uh, Bangoma. And that, that town sounds just like, I mean, it's, it's a very poor, you know, African place. Uh, but he runs this orphanage for these little children and uh, a number of things in this ministry. And he said that one day they were finishing a church service, Pastor Justice. They finished a church service and a woman came in with her dead baby boy. And she asked him to pray for her boy, for her baby. And you mothers, you can only, you can only imagine this woman's heart. So Pastor Justice said they began to pray for this baby. And they prayed for about 20 minutes. And they got tired, you know. Prayer is not an easy thing. Prayer is like wrestling with God at times. And that's what they're calling out to God for 20 minutes. He said, we got, we got tired. And I can relate to it. Like you just want to wrap it up. doesn't matter if you're a church leader. You get tired like everybody else. And the mother said, pray. And so they kept on praying. And about the time it seemed like they were trying to wrap it up with this blue baby lying there. Mom said, pray. 
And they continued to pray. And they continued to pray. And every single time, it seemed like they were going to wrap it up. Pray. Two hours into the prayer, that baby came back to life. Amen. Two hours. See, we'll never see things like that unless we're willing to just keep it up. Persistence. Faith that goes through the roof. Wow. When he saw their faith, was it just the faith of these friends? Maybe the paralytic was the one who said, take me there. Maybe the paralytic had heard about Jesus. Maybe the paralytic had heard that he opened the eyes of blind men and that people who had been lame were able to walk and people who were deaf and mute were able to speak and hear. And perhaps it was his faith or maybe it was the whole group of these, I'm assuming, young men. And this man heard about Jesus and he thought, that's for me. Get me there. Romans says this. I'm going to read from the Amplified. This is Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing what is told, and what is heard comes by the preaching of the message that came from the lips of Christ the Messiah himself. Now quickly, before we close today, we read again in verse 5 of Mark 2, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, Son, your sins are forgiven. Isn't it wonderful, people, that when you come to Jesus, when you lower yourself before Jesus, he calls you son. He calls you daughter. And he says, your sin is forgiven. Again, he's not afraid of your sin mess. And sin sickness is worse than physical sickness. Again, I think of people like the great hymn writer, Fanny J. Crosby, who was dead, or who was blind. All of her life she was blind, but she wrote the most beautiful hymns because she saw heaven and she saw Jesus better than us sighted people. So it wasn't her physical condition that needed healing. She was healed spiritually. And physical sickness can come from sin, drugs, alcohol. Overeating, not exercising, uh, smoking, all kinds of things. So Jesus forgives this man's sin because his sin sickness is the heart of all other sickness. Now, quickly, verse 6 and 7. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? People, be aware that when you follow Jesus... You'll go through the same things he did. When Jesus himself is criticized, don't think it's just because you're a Christian and you do everything right that everybody's going to applaud you. It's just not going to happen like that. These men are inches away from God and seconds away from witnessing a physical miracle and their stubbornness is keeping them from seeing who Jesus is. Immediately, verse 8, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Then if Jesus said to us, if he says to you, why are you thinking this? Or why are you acting this way? I hope you're going to respond quickly, you know. I know there are things that Jesus tried to, to, to touch in my life and I just wouldn't give it to him. You know what I mean? And it's pretty bad when you know Jesus has just kept his finger there. And Jesus' finger is not going to leave there. He's just going to keep it there on you until you respond. And I, so here he is. Why, why are you thinking these things? Why are you doing these things? And then he says in verse 9, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and take your mat and walk but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take up your mat, and go home. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus makes this man responsible for cleaning up some of his own mess, pick up the mat, and then he tells him, go home. What's that say to us? Resume your life. You know, so many of us are afraid Jesus is going to call us to India or Bangladesh. You know, he's going to make us do something we don't want to do. It's going to be 
murder. You know, we're not going to have a good life. That's not what he says to most of us. He just says, go home. Resume your life. Show who I am in your own neighborhood. So we read in verse 12, he got up, took his mat, walked in full view of them all, this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like that. Can you imagine attending the Bible study that day, being one of those people that was in, the, in that room with that dust and the clay bits, and there in the presence of Jesus, and then on top of everything witnessing this? Now I'm going to close by saying this. The difference between those of us who read about or hear about or even actually see a miracle and those who get a miracle, a healing, a provision, a mended marriage, whatever it may be that you're seeking Jesus for, the difference is believing God and going after it and letting nothing stand in the way. Let me close with Mark 11. Starting in verse 22, Jesus said this to us, have faith in God. I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, boy, this is, a, this is a caveat, people. If you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. We're all paralyzed, people, initially by sin. And sometimes we're paralyzed by doubt. And sometimes we're paralyzed because of our own stubborn will. We just don't want to surrender to Jesus. And so we need to confess that. We need to go before him. And we need to repent. And Luke 137, and I close with this, for nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. Let's stand up. And let's close with a word of prayer. Father, there's nothing recorded in Scripture that is there by accident. And what we look at this, this event in the ministry of Jesus today is to speak to us about our need to be persistent in prayer to be persistent in coming to Jesus to find that deliverance or to find that healing physically or to, or to find that emotional healing, whatever it is, God. We don't want anything, any obstacle to block us from coming before our Lord and our Savior who loved us enough to let himself be bled to death on our behalf. And so, Father, we are thankful for this message today. And I pray, Father, that this, we not just be hearers today, but that we be doers from what we've learned. I thank you for each one of this roof today, Father. We do come before you today and, and plead with you, Lord, to restore our nation. We don't deserve your mercy. We don't deserve your grace. But we do pray for grace over this nation. And we pray, Lord, for a repentant spirit to come on your people and on those outside the church. And we pray, Lord, for that great awakening and that revival that we've been calling out to you for years. We pray, Lord, that this would come and come soon. And we ask this in the name of Jesus and a blessing on each one under this roof. Again, in Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen. Amen.